Cryptic Canticles welcomes you to the Dracula Radio Play experience. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this full audio performance of Bram Stoker's masterpiece, released chronologically by entry date. Dr. Seward's Diary, 13 September. Called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing, as usual, up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colors, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenra coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Ha I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How do you mean, ma'am? Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that the heavy odor would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into the boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen gray. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me, suddenly and forcibly, into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair, and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair, and putting his hands before his face, began to sob with a loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. God! 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 What have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still, sent down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be and in such way? This poor mother, all unknowing and all for the best as she think, does such thing as we lose her daughter, body and soul. And we must not tell her. And we must not warn her or she die. Then both die. Oh, how we are beset. How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come. Come. We must see and act. Devils or no devils or all the devils at once, it matters not. We must fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again I drew up the blind, whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful, waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured, with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word he went and locked the door and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No. Today you must operate. 
I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation. Again the narcotic. Again some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westenrod that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their odor was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and would send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright, and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. You have been listening to Bram Stoker's Dracula, the radio play as presented by the Cryptic Canticles. Stay tuned for our next episode at crypticcanticles.com.